It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. Conversations with Joan focuses on topics that are important to your life, from health and wellness to professional development to personal well-being. Change makers join me to share their insights, tips, and strategies so you can thrive and live your best life now. Thank you for taking time for yourself, and thank you for letting us be a part of your life. Now, let's start talking. We all lose people and experiences we hold dear. Nothing we love lasts forever. Grieving is a part of being human. Grief can hit us quickly like a bolt of lightning, or it can silently creep up on us before we even know we're in its grip. Many of us try to deny what we're feeling in an attempt to stay positive or stop the pain. According to today's guest, Claire B. Willis, to heal from loss, we cannot disassociate or refuse to feel the depth of our despair. She contends that genuine grieving requires us to be present with the anguish and to be open to the pain of our heartbreak and even embrace our sadness. Claire is a clinical social worker who has been working in the fields of oncology and bereavement for more than 20 years. She is the co-author of Opening to Grief, Finding Your Way from Loss to Peace. Welcome, Claire. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Joan. I'm so happy to be here. So, Claire, as I said in the introduction, we all grieve a loss at one time or another. For the sake of this conversation, what do you mean when you use the word grief? Um, Grief is a, a natural response to a loss of any kind. It applies to any and everything, as big and as large as any loss could be. So it's just a natural response, and I want to emphasize natural because I think so often people have judgments about grief, and so I just want to normalize it and universalize it Mm -hmm. throughout the conversation we have today. If grief is a natural part of living, how does it manifest in our lives? Well, there's a lot of ways. I think one of the common misconceptions about grief is that grief is, expresses itself through sorrow, sadness, despair, hopelessness. But actually, grief has as many different expressions almost as there are people. So for some people, grief, in fact, for a lot of people, grief comes across as anger or rage. It can be expressed as impatience, irritability, and regret regret's a big one. And it even can have positive uh, feelings connected to it, like gratitude. Gratitude is a common one that goes with grief. I hear people say, "I'm, despite how sad I am, I'm so grateful I was able to love this person for as long as I was able to love them. And so I think it's important because oftentimes in families, what happens is that people grieve differently. And because they're grieving differently, people think other members of the family are grieving and it creates a lot of conflict. It also can um, express itself cognitively in, by, in our thinking. Our thinking becomes less clear. We're often confused. We're easily overwhelmed. We often, many people can't focus at all. People find it hard to read and concentrate. Um, We get forgetful. In behaviorally, often people will do things. They'll overeat. They'll undereat. They'll overexercise. They're underexercised. They'll overwork. They'll underwork. So the grief has a lot of expressions behaviorally. And I think especially in the time when people have a traumatic loss, that people can have their spirituality or their religion Um, shattered by not being able to understand why this thing has happened. And I think it often accompanies traumatic losses, the spiritual crisis and the the expression of lack of faith or shattered faith. You know, it's so interesting, all of the things that you just described, because I'm sure many people don't associate some of those things with grieving. You know, we have this idea that we go through loss and then, you know, it's kind of like a one and done thing. We should be done. We should move on and it's, it's over. I, I remember, you know, about a little over 10 years ago at the start of all the work I'm doing now, this all resulted really from traumatic loss. And in a period of six months, my 23 year marriage ended, my mother died, my sister died and my oldest son left for college. And so it was like one day I had this particular life and, and the next it was gone. And you know, as time passed, in, when, when you go through this loss in the early stages, people are around you. 
But as time passes, you, you start to get this feeling, well, you know, people don't really want to hear it anymore. It's old news. And so how do we navigate those feelings we may be having about sharing our pain with others? That's a really interesting question you're asking, because I think it touches on a few things here. One is that when we lose someone we love, or you had what I would call a pileup of losses, you had a bunch of them, um, what happens is that there are what they call in the literature secondary losses. I like the word invisible better. But for instance, when you lose a partner, whether it's through divorce or separation or death, there are losses that accompany that loss that are called secondary, but they're actually not secondary, often in, in impact. In, in, in impact, they can actually be primary. So for instance, the other night in my bereavement group, someone said, you know, I don't miss my partner so much as I miss being part of a couple. And then she talked about how friends weren't calling. Other couples would call from Monday to Thursday, but no one called on the weekend. People often experience other losses, such as the, a loss of economic stability, the loss of a co-parent, the loss of someone with whom they were planning future dreams. Some people lose their homes and have to move. So that when someone dies or there's a change that results in a big loss, there are so many tendrils and other aspects of our life that this also touches so I think that's an important thing just to identify and name because often people are overwhelmed with grief and it's way more than the loss of the person. It's that and many other losses as well. Well, as you were saying that, I was thinking just with my divorce alone, it was not just the loss of my husband, but the loss of his entire family. People that's that right. were like brothers and sisters and cousins all of a sudden were gone as well. So you're right. It's not just the one person. It's the dreams. And then it's all those other people that are no longer That's part right. of your life as well. That's right. That's right. There are multiple levels of losses. One of the things that happens is people will hang out initially in the face of a loss, but people return to their lives far faster than the person who's grieving is ready for that to happen. And I think often the second year of grief in the face of a loss is harder than the first year or especially in the face of a death, I should say, because the first year is taken up with a lot of material planning of the closing of the life, the funeral, all of that. And often it's not until the second year that people begin to grasp what's happened because when we're coping with a loss, we can't deal with it. And when we're dealing with a loss, we can't cope. So we have to choose between coping and dealing. And that first year is about coping. And often later on, the emotional impact is what comes to the foreground and people are surprised. They'll say, oh, I thought I should be better by now. Well, you know, grief doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. It just changes form. And it changes forms for many years to come. I mean, people have said to me, yes. I don't know how you move forward from all of that. But, you know, the intensity lessens. You're able to get on with your life more and more. But, you know, 10 years later, I can be walking down a supermarket aisle and see a box of cereal and start That's to right. cry. And so I want to go <laughs> yes. over with you the stages of grief. Can I say something about sure. what you just said before we go on? Because I think what you just said is really important, Joan. Okay. When you're walking down a supermarket aisle and you see a box of cereal and you melt down, I often hear in my bereavement groups, I thought I was doing so well and I walked down the aisle of the market and I saw the cereal and I lost it. And I say to people, you didn't lose it. You had a moment of grasping the full magnitude of what you've lost. We can't hold it all the time because looking at death is like looking at the sun. We look, we turn away, we look, we turn away. We can't sustain it because our psyche couldn't endure it. So our grief comes in waves. And that particular wave that you just described is called, there's an acronym for it, and it's called STUG, um, Sudden temporary upsurge of grief and it happens when people are grieving and invariably they turn on themselves and say I thought I was doing well well it's always temporary and that's the thing to remember that when you have a, a temporary upsurge of grief it doesn't mean you're you've set yourself back it means you've just had a moment of fully grasping what you've lost so I wanted to just pause on that before you went on but I'm glad you did because it actually is a perfect segue into the grief model because it's not linear the grief model that's, you know you can go right. from anger to acceptance to denial and then right back to a, a different level of it 
those stages were in, originally intended to describe the grief of someone who was dying, and they've been overlaid on the people who are grieving. And while those different stages, apply, some of those stages apply, they don't apply in a linear fashion. We all go through denial, we go through acceptance, we go through anger, we go through integration, but it doesn't happen in any sequence. And some people don't even go into all of those stages. So I think we have to be careful with the stage models because what happens is that people will compare themselves to what they know about the stage model. And then they end up shaming themselves for not grieving properly. I don't know whether you've read this quote or heard this before, but I think this is so beautiful. And I, I wish I had found it before I wrote the book. Um, this is something that a man named Jamie Anderson wrote. Grief, I have learned, is really just love. It's all the love you want to give but cannot. All that unspent love gathers up in the corners of your eyes, the lump in your throat, and in that hollow part of your chest. Grief is just love with no place to go. And I think I love these words because it means that we shouldn't, it suggests certainly that we should never suppress our grief because if we suppress our grief, we're suppressing our love. When should a person maybe start to believe that it's time for help? Like how do they know if it's a natural part of grieving or if maybe there's something a little bit deeper going on? That's a great question. Um, I think that what you're talking about is sort of what is the difference between grief and depression? So if you're not eating, if you're not leaving the house, if you're drinking too much, if you're having thoughts of suicide or joining your loved one somewhere, those are really ominous signs and should be you should seek care for them. The other thing is that with depression, there are no moments of light. It, it's a gray lens on your on your view of the world. There, there are no breakthroughs of, of delight or happiness. With grief, grief comes in waves. It comes and it goes. And while you may not want to leave the house and you may have an extra drink, it, it's not that sustained darkness that depression will bring. Can a person get stuck in the grieving process? I think depending on pre-existing conditions, yes, they can. I think if you come into, I mean, actually there's a lot of reasons you could get stuck. You could get stuck depending on the um, the details around the death. For instance, I think a suicide can often leave one stuck when there's been a complicated relationship. Um, traumatic deaths uh, can be sticking points. Um, if you've been predisposed to a mental illness beforehand or you're not a very stable person, I think you can get stuck and need some help. So I, I don't think most people don't get stuck, although I think people often feel they're stuck. But mm -hmm. I think that's more a question of being impatient with the process. But yes, I think you can get stuck. And usually it's because of extraordinary circumstances outside or specific complications of the grief, which I've just mentioned. So what about the pandemic that we've all been experiencing? People are, you know, they've lost the, the way they're, of their life. Maybe they've lost their jobs or they've lost a loved one or they've lost their health because of coronavirus. So how has the pandemic impacted the way we grieve? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, um, uh, David Brooks, a New York Times columnist, wrote a column last year. He wrote and asked people how they were doing. And within three days, he had 5,000 replies. And what he discovered was, he described at the end of this article, there's a river of grief, a river of woe that's flowing through our culture. And I love his description of a river because water touches everything. Water seeps in where you don't know it. So everybody in the world has suffered some loss around uh, coronavirus. One of the problems that's happened, emerged, is that not only do we have losses from COVID, but if you have old losses in your life that you haven't grieved, those losses will get evoked from the losses brought about by COVID. So anything you haven't grieved is probably going to come roaring back and be a little confusing for people because they may say, oh, that my mother died 12 years ago. I don't know why I'm thinking about her now. But that's one of the things that's happened. One of the silver linings of 
the virus has been that grief is now a word in our mainstream media. It's now in our our daily life. And I love that the nuances of grief have been introduced and that it's being normalized and talked about in a way that it never was before. Claire, normally when a person experiences grief, the, the people around them are usually in a better or a healthier mental state. But when we're all experiencing the losses of a pandemic, should we be cautioned about spending so much time talking about the pain with other people who are talking about their pain? Can we go down a very slippery slope by doing that? I don't know. I think it really depends on the person. I think sharing suffering is really important because it lessens the feeling of being alone. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's been really important about this is that We are all in this together, and there's been a loneliness of being isolated, but the fact that we're all in this together is also a comfort. So I don't know. Now, Ross Ross Gay, a poet who's an author who's written a book called The Book of Delights, I read a quote by him the other day, and he said, shared suffering, it was something like this, shared suffering can be a source of delight. And I thought, you know, I see this in my groups, that when people see that other people are living with the same experience they are, it's deeply, deeply comforting. So I guess we just have to be careful not to let it become over-consuming, that that's all we talk about. Yes, because there's a lot of blessings that have emerged from this. We've seen expressions of kindness. We've seen people making personal sacrifices. And I think many of us have reordered our priorities. And I think one of the questions that's really important is to think about what have been the gifts of this time. And as we, we're sitting on a threshold now that I think is very important, like we're almost coming back into life, although there's still certainly a lot of uncertainty, but what of this time of isolation and social distancing and confinement, what about that did we learn about in ourselves that we want to bring forward into a life that's not the same that we had before, but might be richer. Can you share with us a few practices that can help us heal? Yeah, I think, well, you know, actually, it's interesting that you just asked me that, because one of the things to help hold grief would be to have a gratitude practice. And there's a lot of research about the neuroplasticity of our brain. And one of the things that they're learning is that The mind is uh, negative, hardwired to be negatively habituated. We tend to notice what's wrong before we notice what's right. So, for instance, if your viewers or your listeners, I should say, and 99% of them said I did a good job and 1% said I did a bad job, my attention would probably go to the 1% and wonder what they were thinking. So what has happened is that because we are we are wired to be habituated negatively. But what's happened is that it really skews the way we experience life. So let's just take a typical morning in your home. You get up, maybe you make a cup of coffee, you use the toilet, you brush your teeth, you get dressed and you leave the house. And you don't notice when all of that works fine. But if the coffee maker overflows or the toilet gets clogged up or you have a fender bender on your way to where you're going, you're probably going to get there and say, I had a crappy morning. Mm -hmm. It was really hard, right? You notice it because your expectations were broken. You notice what happened that was wrong. You don't get to work and say, hey, guess what? The toilet flushed, the coffee maker worked, I got here safely. You don't notice that. We notice what's wrong in disproportion. When we have negative experiences, they stick. We may not remember the details, but we remember the impact. Positive experiences flow through us. We don't remember them in the same way. So one of the ways to develop the capacity to hold our suffering and our grief with more resilience is to cultivate a gratitude practice. One of the things that I do before I go to bed is I write down three things that were positive that happened that day, three things that I'm grateful for. And what happens is when I'm committed to that practice, I begin to look for what's right the next day because I'm keeping a gratitude journal. Now, when you notice what's right, what's important is to linger with it for 10 to 30 seconds. And what will happen is you begin to rewire the brain to notice not only what's wrong, because we don't want to miss what's wrong, 
but to begin to notice in the same way what's right. And what that does is it will strengthen our capacity to hold our suffering. And so it's a very important practice. And if you do this for 21 days, there's a ton of research that talks about how you change your happiness level inside. But we're not doing it to change happiness. We're doing it so that we can hold the suffering and the sorrow in our lives with more ease and resilience. You know, Claire, when I went through those challenges, I started doing a gratitude journal at night. And I remember I was going to write down five things every night. And the first night I thought, oh, I'm, I don't have five things to be happy for. And once yeah. I started listing them, it's like a floodgate opens. And that's you think right. you're going to do five and, and you could do 30 very that's easily. Right. And, and that's you know, a wonderful practice. One of the things that, I, and I just want to add to that is that uh, when you write the gratitude, it's important that you write the gratitude in positive language. So, for instance, let's say you're a young mother with a house full of children. You don't write, I'm grateful that the house wasn't noisy today. That's a negative expression of a positive experience. You write, I'm grateful there was peace in the house today. I'm grateful for the peace in the house. You write a positive with positive language, and it goes in deeper. So I'm so glad to hear that you kept a gratitude journal because <laughs> hearing, hearing that it made a difference for you is, is, makes it more credible than my just saying it. <laughs> and to be honest, when I started it, I really didn't know what I was doing. I just did it on my own, but it really yeah, did have a positive experience. It's the one thing that you can do that on a basis of research has shown that people get ha live happier lives. But I think what's more to the point with grief is that it helps us hold our grief more effectively. The book is Opening to Grief, Finding Your Way from Loss to Peace. If you'd like to get more information about Claire and her work, you can visit openingtogrief.com. Claire, thank you so much for joining us. It has really been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for having me, Joan. Thank you for joining us. I hope you found the show informative. At Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life, we believe that knowledge is power. Take what you've learned, apply it, and live your best life now. Remember that the information provided is the opinion of our guest and should never replace the advice of a professional who knows your personal situation. If you'd like more information, visit our website, CYA, CYL.com. That stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on our site, listen to past shows on demand, read the digital magazine, sign up for our mailing list, and be sure to follow the show on social media. Until next time, this is Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in.